So what are, what are some of the, um, or, or how, how does it come out of, you know, the, the notion of being indigenous to a particular place? Is there a sense of having been there for a long time, having a strong spiritual connection to the land, having um, an investment, and not just in monetary terms, but an investment of labor, of love to, to a specific term? Is there, can we make a general statement, or are there a multitude of relationships that, that are important? Yeah. Well, I think there's a multitude of different ways that people express this connection to place. We say the land, but it can equally be to the streetscapes of a local town or local parks and so on. Uh, I think that, um, you know, Aboriginal people have a particular cultural body of, <clears throat> body of cultural information which connects them to the land. Um, which we could talk about, some of the details. Uh, and that's not shared by the others of different, of other ancestries, people from different countries who've come in as migrants. But then, after generations, um, on cattle stations or in towns, people develop a strong sense of connectedness in different ways. They may not use the word spiritual for it, but familiarity, mm -hmm. uh, places where their forebears have lived and where their children have grown, uh, places where possibly some members of their family are buried mm -hmm. uh, or have died, um, places where people have invested a lot of their labour and made a living mm -hmm. and uh, put enormous sort of sweat into the land, if you like. And I think, um, yeah, that those kinds of ways of talking about the connections are more common among white fellows, whereas it's sort of spiritual connections and the occupation by earlier generations going back a long way that Aboriginal people talk about. Can you give us some specific examples of Aboriginal connections to land in this region? Well, um, our research shows over the years that, you know, Aboriginal people believe strongly in the spiritual properties or characteristics of lands and waters. Uh, sometimes there are dreaming tracks that, um, that totemic beings have traveled across and left things there. And other times a particular spiritual presence will be just located in one location, like around the waterhole. Um, this kind of a flowing stream where we, where beside here um, there's a certain kind of water spirit that's spoken about. And there's also in the Gulf country uh, the idea of country having skins, having a particular skin. Can you explain what that means a little, a little bit more? So a skin, which is an English word, which, so that's an approximation of the idea of skins which has their own which which has its own terms in the different Aboriginal languages. Uh, but the idea of country or plants or animals or people having a skin uh, refers to a sort of internal essence, an internal spiritual essence. And in this part of Australia there is a system of belief which divides uh, the world into eight skin categories. So when the system is working fully in a traditional way, um, a person is born into a particular one of eight skin categories uh, and that reflects their relationship to uh, the country and the dreamings which have the same skin as themselves or other skins. I'm from, like, the Garwa group up in the Northern Territory. Um, a place on the Robertson, got out of homestead there, Robertson River community. Yeah. Mm. What are they, what name do they call that place, the Robertson River community? Robertson River community itself, it's called Mugularungu. Yeah, Mugularungu. Where does that name come from? It's come from that place there again from all Garwa people sort of being like a water hole on the, on the river. Yeah. 
we have some, um, areas, all water holes, mainly on the river, have different parts and bush names for them area. So that Mugularung, it's like a bush name for that waterhole on the Robinson River. Yeah. And that's where the actual community is and that's where the old station was. Yep. What about people? They got a skin? People got skin mm. from that from that country. Yeah. Say for instance, a rainbow travels through that country, it gives a it's a mumble ear skin that country. So it's Mumbalia, Rainbow is Mumbalia. And gives us gives me my skin from a Bolani father, um Balirini. You're right. Some of the anthropological research that I've done for native title, we've done, um, talks about a process of succession of those people who moved in becoming the successors. Hmm. Uh, in, a, in a way, a commensurate with law and custom, with tradition. Now, um, those forms of change, not all forms of change, I think, can be understood in that way, and there will be forms of change where traditional ties may well be ruptured completely. But in this part of the Gulf country, uh, the conclusions that I've come to, both in academic work and in applied research, have argued for that form of succession. They just mentioned an important term, native title. Mm. Can you give us a, a very brief introduction to what native title is and the role of anthropology within it? Well, briefly, there is legislation in Australia which allows Aboriginal people to, uh, to claim some rights in land. Under native title, they're not going to be able to claim ownership in the way that the Australian legal system usually works, but they can claim quite strong rights uh, derived from their continuing law and custom over time, to use the terms of the legislation. So in native title uh, from the early 1990s and before that in other kinds of land claims, uh, the role of anthropology has actually been quite central and important, somewhat controversial, but in my view uh, it's been an important part of doing anthropology in Australia with Aboriginal people. So conflict um, between in and amongst Aboriginal groups and Aboriginal people in terms of land use, in terms of um, the relation to land and some of these developments you're talking about, such as mining, um, but also with other people who are occupying the land, such as graziers on, on big cattle stations in the region. Is there a lot of conflict or is it an issue? Is there a competition over land? Well, I think historically, yes, and now, yes, there has been dispute, contest at times. They're still trying to get it together, you know, how, how, how to... Um come to terms with the white people yeah. of telling them that that's, that's, that's our land you move on, you know, and all that sort of thing. They're still fighting about them sort of thing, yet, yeah, them people on this side. And, um, you know, they're all talking about compensation and stuff like that, you know, the government should um, release some compensation to them and regarding their land with the uh, white yeah. people, our cattle station, and all on their, their land and stuff like that. In our research, we find also a great deal of accommodation on both sides and we find familiarity and um, intimacies and uh, positive relationships, if you like, between white fellows and black fellows. Um, in a way, w our research is really interested in this kind of complex mix of people's ancestries and and the fact that not every not everybody agrees not everybody has the one position um, our collaborators with Chinese Aboriginal ancestry who we've interviewed in the last few days make it pretty clear that um, they they don't take a hostile or a disputation uh, approach to their lives with others they 
have enjoyed lots of positive relationships with people of European and, and then of solely Aboriginal ancestry as well. Um, so my answer is that uh, as part of analytically as an anthropologist what I call the politics of indigenism, what we call that, there is contest and dispute and inevitably that will continue and, and so on and the, and the courts and there'll be a sort of political process. But um, I'm optimistic about the way people's identities in this country overlap already. So when you get through the disputation, there's an underlying strength of sort of living together in, in my view.